Good morning, everybody, and a special early good morning to, to our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Pavlovich, uh, Mandy Pavlovich. Um, I have just a brief introduction for her. So Dr. Pavlovich uh, received her MD and her PhD at the University of Washington. Uh, she completed a residency in internal medicine at Mass General Hospital and a fellowship in oncology at the Dana-Farber Partners <laughs> Cancer Center in Boston. Um, her postdoc training was done at MIT Whitehead Center for Genomics Research, working with Dr. Eric Lander. As an oncologist, Dr. Polovich was struck by the paucity of quantitative assays for measuring clinically relevant phenotypes in her patients and the limitations that this put on her ability to practice uh, precision or personalized medicine. Out of these experiences, she became passionate about developing technologies and strategies for translation of novel diagnostics and therapies and um, therapeutics to enable precision medicine. Over the past 17 years, Dr. Polovich's research has focused on relieving a roadblock in biomedical research, a lack of validated and standardized tools for quantifying human proteins. She was inducted into the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Uh, she received the 2014 Life Science Innovation Northwest Women to Watch and Life Science Award. And she also received the 2015 Distinguished Achievement in Proteomic Sciences Award from the Human Proteome Organization. And she was also awarded the Avon Foundation Endowed Chair in 2018. She was appointed the director of the Clinical Research Proteomics Platform of the Brotman Beatty Institute for Precision Medicine in 2019. And she is currently a professor in the Division of Oncology within the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And also, which I think is super cool, she's a director of the CLIA Certified Targeted Proteomic Laboratory um, at the Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Research Center. And I'm super excited to hear from Mandy today and I'm looking forward to hear your talk today regarding uh, developing MRM assays for the translation, translation of novel diagnostics and therapeutics to enable precision medicine. So thank you very much again, Mandy, and thanks again for being here so super early. We're looking forward to your talk. Okay, I have my gigantic mug here of caffeine, so we're all good. <laughs> no, this is, this is great. Thank you so much for the invitation, Stephanie. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with folks and get to know folks there. So I, I, I do appreciate that. <clears throat> so as Stephanie mentioned, I am particularly interested <clears throat> in uh, precision oncology, which we didn't call back in the days it, that back in the days when I got interested in it, but I was frustrated treating my patients, <clears throat> not knowing ahead of time for sure who was really going to respond to what. And so things have evolved a bit since those days. Now we um, do personalized oncology using the tumor genome uh, in modern trials. So we obtain a biopsy, we sequence the DNA, look for actionable mutations, and, and select a therapy. And we've come a long way, but uh, there's a lot of progress left to be made. As anybody who treats patients knows, uh, over half of tumors don't respond to the drug that our tumor is responsible the tumor is predicted to respond to based on the genome sequence. And in the vast majority of cases, initially responsive tumors ultimately develop drug resistance. And so we still have more work to do. And then the question is, how can we make the genome more actionable to help our patients? <clears throat> well, currently, uh, personalized oncology, as I mentioned, is largely genome driven. And the problem with that is that now through a large number of studies, we know that the correlation between genomic measurements and protein levels of expression or activity are not that great. Uh, correlations at expression level are on the order of 0.4 across a large number of tumors now. And so this presents an issue because the majority of modern therapies target proteins and protein networks. And in fact, many modern therapies such as monoclonal-based therapies are themselves proteins. And uh, so that raises the question of, well, why aren't we measuring proteins? Why are we driving precision oncology with nucleic acids? And that's because of a technological gap. We have next-gen technologies uh, for the nucleic acids, but for proteins, we still use 50-year-old immunoassay platforms, which do have strengths and have taken us a long way, but are really inadequate to meet the needs of a post-genomic community where we need to be able to quantify protein networks, for example, in multiplex with high specificity um, and um, uh, the ability to harmonize those across laboratories, which has been challenging for some of the conventional technologies. And so we've been working in a, an NCI network called CPTAC, which stands for Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Center. 
And Stephanie and I actually met there. Um, she was a fantastic colleague in that program. And we've been working for a long time to try and solve this technological gap and have developed through that program a platform based on targeted mass spectrometry that we think can help to relieve this problem. Now, uh, my understanding from Stephanie is there's a variety of um, folks in the audience, some of whom may not um, know the, the basics of mass spec. And so I put in just a slide here to cartoon that out. Um, <clears throat> basically, in, in proteomic-based mass spec, we extract proteins from biospecimens. We proteolize those with an enzyme, typically trypsin, to release predictable peptide sequences. And these peptides are ionized and nebulized in a mass spectrometer to produce precursor ions. And based on the primary amino acid sequence of the peptide, each precursor ion has a characteristic mass to charge ratio, which is measured in the mass spectrometer. Within the instrument, these peptides are bombarded with inert gas molecules, which causes them to fragment. And they tend to fragment at these peptide bonds, producing a series of fragment ions each of which has its own mass to charge ratio. And these fragment ions ping the detector producing a mass fingerprint. And if you know the genome sequence from which the protein uh, came, you can basically do image mapping um, type of algorithms to infer what protein this, or, uh, what peptide and then what protein this, this uh, fingerprint came from. Now in proteomics, there are broadly two flavors of mass spectrometry that we use. One is untargeted and the other is targeted. For untargeted, also called shotgun proteomics, these produce global surveys of the proteome. They're an attempt to see everything in the proteome and the genomic equivalent would be a whole exome sequence or RNA-seq of the whole <coughs> RNA of the transcriptome. Uh, the second one is targeted mass spectrometry, and there are various forms of this. I'm going to talk about MRM, or multiple reaction monitoring, today. And this is really the equivalent of a qPCR assay developed to look for a specific transcript of interest and quantify it across samples. And as I'm going to show you in a moment, these two forms of mass spectrometry can be used in sequence to support biomarker translation programs. Here's an example of that. Um, <clears throat> this is um, an overview of work that's being done in this cycle of the CPTAC program at NCI, where we take a variety of human cancers and we perform proteomic analysis on them in the broad, global, untargeted sense, and we perform genomic analysis of them, and then we integrate those data sets uh, in what's, what's been dubbed proteogenomics uh, now, to create data resources for the community to mine, to generate hypotheses about the biology and potential treatment of those tumors. So these are hypothesis generating data sets and anything of interest or potential interest must be further validated downstream using higher throughput, more quantitative assays. And for that, we use these targeted mass spec methods such as MRM which again, don't try to look at everything globally, but uh, focus on quantification of pre-specified proteins of interest, such as proteins that come out of those discovery efforts. And there the workflow is quite similar. We extract proteins, except now we spike in heavy labeled versions of all of those, pro the, the full length protein or fragments of those proteins. So um, these serve as internal standards, they have a stable isotope label on them, and so that creates a mass shift relative to the protein in the patient sample. That mixture is trypsinized just as before. If we break open human cells, there are about 5,000 proteins at least that can be quantified from neat cell lysates. If we want to quantify lower abundance proteins or most proteins in plasma or many post-translational modifications, an enrichment step is required. You can do that biochemically, but we use uh, immuno-enrichment for a lot of our assays where we generate custom antibodies to immuno-affinity enrich the patient's peptides alongside the spiked-in stable isotope labeled version of that peptide, that internal standard, to get thousands of fold enrichment of the selected peptides, which then can be quantified in a mass spectrometer, typically a triple quad or a triple quad-like instrument, which can be programmed 
not to try and see everything in that sample, but to look specifically for the mass to charge ratios of the peptides that we care about, because those come from proteins that are of high interest to us that we want to measure. Now the mass spectrometer uh, can tell the difference between the patient's peptide, which is uh, relatively light compared to the heavy isotope labeled a uh, spiked inversion, which was spiked in at a known concentration. And the peak area ratio can be used to infer the concentration of the pa patient's uh, analyte. And so these assays, I'll show you um, some examples of this, are, are highly precise, properly run, approach absolute specificity. We do encounter interferences, but if you are careful, most of those can be overcome. They have a large linear range, much larger than conventional assays. And the high specificity in the large linear range mean that these assays can be readily multiplexed and through the sharing of internal standards, especially can be harmonized across the community. This slide just makes the point that making antibodies for these assays is easier than making antibodies for conventional assays. And that's because the mass spectrometer is the detector. It's not a fluorescent signal, but it's a highly specific detector that's analyzing the mass of the analytes. And so here, for example, we have a monoclonal antibody that we generated that can capture eight different proteoforms of two different MAP kinases. This antibody would be a disaster for Western blotting or IHC, but for MRM, this is a fantastic antibody because the mass spectrometer can distinguish all of these proteoforms in the captured sample. And for one antibody, we can quantify a lot of different proteins. Now here's an example of applying this untargeted to targeted proteomic pipeline in the setting of one of these CPTAC tumor studies. Uh, this is actually a paper that just came out last week uh, where we took over 200 pediatric uh, brain cancers and performed genomic profiling as well as proteomic profiling and did the proteogenomic integrated analysis and identified a subset of pediatric craniopharyngiomas that appear to have a signature of high activity of the MEK kinase. We developed a targeted MRM assay panel to go after a handful of proteins that appear to distinguish the MEK activated or MEK high from MEK low tumors, and we're able to recapitulate that separation using the targeted assay. And we've now um, written a, a DOD grant to try and move this into a clinical trial where we use this assay in, in part to try and um, identify patients who may uh, benefit from a MEK inhibitor. So this is just kind of an example of the spectrum and the pipeline that gets put together. So our goal, of course, is to, is to try and move these uh, clinically. And to that end, uh, we, we meaning um, our program at CPTAC, has worked hard with uh, partnerships with the AACC, CLSI, and the FDA to try to come up with a series of fit-for-purpose bioanalytical validation experiments that should be done on MRM-based assays. Um, they look very similar to the kinds of experiments that you would do to validate a, an ELISA assay with a few things that are more specific to the mass spec detector. Um, and in fact, we've written a, a CLSI guidance document that's been through its public review um, on the measurement of proteins with uh, mass spectrometry, and this should get published in 2021. Of course, MRM is not new to clinical laboratorians, as you guys probably know uh, better than me. Uh, many of you have used this for decades to quantify small molecules, such as the metabolites uh, measured during newborn screening, as well as uh, drug metabolites and therapeutic monitoring of drugs. And so um, what we're really hoping to do here is to stand on the shoulders of everybody that's been doing this for a long time in clinical labs and to um, morph the technology to apply it to larger molecules than these metabolites, namely these proteins. And of course, the, the use of this technique in clinical labs for small molecules lays the groundwork for doing um, this with proteins. And in fact, we do have um, a laboratory developed test <clears throat> that has been translated uh, this is an assay for the uh, biomarker thyroglobulin. Uh, the clinical assay has uh, issues in about 20% of thyroid cancer patients who make autoantibodies that interfere with the ELISA. Uh, 
So we built an immuno MRM assay uh, based on a monoclonal antibody uh, that allows the quantification of fibroglobulin in the setting of those autoantibodies. And that assay is now run as a laboratory developed test in six clinical reference labs in the US and, and Canada, uh, reflexively run in patients who make these autoantibodies. So we do have a proof of concept for moving a blood-based assay uh, forward into the clinic. And I'll talk a little bit later about efforts to, to move a uh, tissue-based assay forward into a uh, laboratory developed test. Um, this is um, just to point out that um, we and others have been doing a lot of work. We have several papers published now applying MRM to quantify proteins from dried blood spots. And these efforts have focused on uh, quantifying proteins that could help to <clears throat> perform early diagnosis, so be incorporated as part of newborn screening to early diagnose the diseases that would benefit from early intervention. Uh, this particular study that I'm showing here was with Wilson's disease, um, and then uh, we have uh, other studies where we've targeted proteins that are uh, uh, not expressed at low or, or no levels in pediatric immuno, primary immunodeficiency disorders. And so this is a kind of an emerging area that's still in its infancy. Nothing has been clinically translated yet. And, and most of the work has been on sort of feasibility and small pilot studies, which have all looked promising. But I think this is an area where you'll see some growth. <clears throat> so next, I was just going to go through a few examples of clinical and translational applications of our MRM, some projects that um, are ongoing in the lab or that we've um, done that, ha that kind of demonstrate the use of the technologies in these uh, precision medicine kinds of settings. <clears throat> this first vignette is um, attempting to identify blood-based biomarkers to um, detect folks who have sensitivity to radiation, for example, who might uh, experience uh, severe toxicity from radiation therapy, which we give to half of our cancer patients. Uh, also, there's interest in identifying biomarkers of radiation exposure and performing biodosimetry, and as well, pharmacodynamic biomarkers. And so uh, what, what we did in these experiments was to take human peripheral blood cells and expose them to ionizing radiation and perform one of these untargeted shotgun proteomic analyses to identify over 30,000 phosphopeptides about 2,300 of which were responsive to ionizing radiation, some of which went up, some of which went down in response to radiation. And then to take these forward into any further studies, uh, applications, we, we can't do that with these large discovery um, type approaches. We have to develop a targeted assay um, to run larger numbers of samples and so uh, in one example of that, we developed a 68-plex immuno MRM assay uh, based on monoclonal antibodies. This assay quantifies both the unmodified and the phosphorylated proteoform of uh, proteins that were identified as being responsive to radiation. This assay, as all of our assays are put through the um, bioanalytical validation um, experiments, and this is done in a matrix of human uh, uh, lymphocyte lysates. <clears throat> and then we could take that validated assay and do some proof of concept where, for example, we irradiate human uh, lymphocytes and then uh, use the assay to monitor the response of those cells over time. And out of that 68 plex panel, I've just pulled six analytes out here as an example where the, the top panels represent the phosphorylated proteoforms of three different proteins in the panel, and the bottom um, represent the unmodified versions of those proteins. And you can see that these um, phosphorylated forms go up as expected in, in response to radiation, and um, the unmodified forms of BRCA1 and Nibirin uh, have a, a concomitant a proportional decrease in their level, presumably because it's getting converted to the phosphoform whereas P53 has a unique shape of its pharmacodynamic curve where it just continues to go up in parallel. Um, this assay uh, replaces 68 Western blots with a 40-minute MRM run. It produces these highly quantitative, highly specific data, and the data are quite precise. These error bars represent bio 
biological triplicates. <clears throat> so uh, properly controlled with standard operating protocols, you can get very precise measurements. Now here's a, here's a translational application of that assay panel. AstraZeneca <clears throat> had tried for, I think, over a year to develop a good pharmacodynamic biomarker for its ATM kinase inhibitor that was headed into clinical trials. The ATM kinase is the ultimate signaling kinase in the DNA damage response pathway, and it's activated in response to ionizing radiation. It's a major therapeutic target of interest in human cancers, and so there's a lot of drug development around that. <clears throat> they had run out of options to test in the network uh, for IHC assays and uh, had not found a good marker, and so they said, well, um, do you think this multiplex assay could help us find one? And so we said, let's give it a try. So they sent us, um, in a blinded fashion, human cells, uh, peripheral blood cells that had been irradiated either in the absence or the presence of their inhibitor compound. And our assay identified a series of proteins, some of which are shown in the, in the figure here, um, which uh, showed a pharmacodynamic response that was muted in response in the presence of the inhibitor. And this phosphorad 50 um, had, there was no assay previously to quantify that. <clears throat> and um, they, they went on to build an orthogonal assay and further validate that in various experimental systems. And now um, this is their biomarker in their clinical trial. And so here's an example, again, of going from discovery to a targeted panel to a real-world application of that panel, in this case, to help with the translation of a novel drug uh, target. Now, making those antibodies takes a long time and uh, costs a fair amount of money, so it's not always feasible to make big panels of antibodies de novo. So this was an interesting experiment here where we asked if there there was a way to generate assays like this without needing to make an antibody while still targeting some of these difficult to measure proteins that require enrichment. And here what we did is, is we use iron metal affinity chromatography or IMAC. And some of you may be familiar with this. It's used broadly in global proteomic discovery experiments to target the phosphoproteome. And essentially um, iron coated magnetic beads which are positively charged, are used to capture um, through electrostatic interactions negatively charged phosphopeptides and enrich them using a, a magnet um, out of the entire proteome. And what we did was to take a human cell lysate that had, been, had, had its phosphosignaling activated through radiation and we uh, performed multiple repeats of throwing these magnetic beads in and seeing what we pulled out. And what we found out was that there were thousands of, of phosphopeptides that were highly reproducibly captured on these beads and appeared to have binding characteristics to the beads comparable to what you might see for an antibody. So we hypothesized that we could make what we called an IMAC MRM assay, not using antibodies, but using these beads uh, to capture phosphopeptides. And we configured a 135 plex IMAC MRM assay um, that targeted phosphorylations that were responsive to radiation in human blood cells. Um, the analytical validation of that um, showed performance that was comparable to the immuno MRM assays that we had. And in fact, when deployed in sort of proof of concept experiments, the assay works uh, quite well. So I just pulled out five of the analytes in the, or the proteins um, uh, quantified in the panel uh, of a total out of 135. And you can see these again are um, uh, triplicate measurements. You can see that you would get really robust pharmacodynamic curves of human cells responding to radiation over time. And this is achieved in a less than one hour MRM run. You get these nice pharmacodynamic measurements of 135 different um, responsive phosphopeptides. <clears throat> so the advantages here are you don't need an, an antibody. The disadvantage is that if your peptide or phosphorylation site of interest just happens not to bind well to those beads, and many of the ones that are the canonical ones in the literature don't, um, you still need to go make an antibody. And so uh, it, you have to have a little bit of luck on your side. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to touch on Fanconi anemia because I know you guys are a major treatment center for Fanconi anemia 
I've had the pleasure of some conversations with uh, John Wagner. Um, for anybody who's not aware, <clears throat> Fanconi is a recessive DNA repair disease that is caused by inherited mutations in any of 23 different genes. So there are many complementation groups in this disease. It is an incidence of about one in 130,000 in the US and uh, one out of 181 of us are carriers. It's associated with physical and developmental defects and a cell-based sensitivity to DNA cross-linking agents. Uh, average lifespan of folks is getting longer, thankfully, now the 20 to 30 year old range. Um, and the common causes of death in these patients are bone marrow failure, leukemia, and if, um, if these uh, patients survive childhood, they, many of them go on to develop solid tumors. The definitive diagnostic test is a chromosomal breakage assay where cells are cultured ex vivo and treated with DNA cross-linking agents, and then chromosomal breaks and fusions are counted. Um, and patients with Fanconi anemia have an elevated level of these abnormalities. Uh, this assay is, um, is the gold standard, but it is laborious and difficult to standardize. Uh, and uh, people have asked many times over the years, are there other options? Of course, in the genomic era, <clears throat> molecular sub subtyping by DNA sequencing is being used clinically, but there are <clears throat> not insignificant number of cases where uh, the calls are uh, complicated by a variety of issues, variants of undetermined significance, you know, promoter methylation, alternative spicing, and, and so on. And so this raises the issue of whether or not quantifying the proteins and the post-translational modifications in the Fanconi network could complement genomic profiling to help resolve some of these issues. And this is an ongoing project that I wanted to talk about because I'm hoping that somebody there will be um, interested in a collaboration around this. Of course, <clears throat> the current state of uh, the art for detecting activation of the Fanconi pathway uh, is Western blotting, looking at the monoubiquitination of the what's called the ID complex, which is the FANC I and the FANC D2 protein. And this complex gets ubiquitinated in the presence of DNA damage if and only if the upstream core complex is formed and is functional. So this is a nice catch net for the acti activation or the functional activity of these uh, upstream proteins. Um, there are downstream signaling events as well that wouldn't get captured by this assay, but the vast majority of cases in the US are due to uh, FANC-A mutation. <clears throat> so what, this, of course, is a, a, it would be a difficult assay to translate clinically based on Western blotting. And so we wanted to ask whether we could develop an MRM-based assay uh, to look at this. <clears throat> so indeed, we were able to develop an antibody that lets us capture um, both the ubiquitinated and the um, non-ubiquitinated proteoforms of that FANC D2 protein from that ID complex. Its analytical performance was robust, and in a series of experiments, one of which I'll show here, uh, that we did in collaboration with Akiko Shimomura, <clears throat> we demonstrated that the assay could be used to, um, uh, to, to pick up defects in patients with Fanconi anemia uh, type A and Fanconi anemia type D2, uh, where if we measure the unmodified FANC-D2 protein, you see very little expression in the FANC-D2 patients. You see normal if it, it, or maybe even slightly increased compared to a control expression of FANC-A in the, in, or, or sorry, a FANC-D2 in the FANC-A patient. And in no, none of these patients who have defects in that upstream core complex do you detect any induction of ubiquitinated FANC-D2 in response to a challenge with the DNA cross-linking agent mitomycin C. And so um, we have additional Fanconi assays available. We're also doing a deep proteomic profiles of Fanconi um, corrected and uncorrected cells, uh, type A, uh, complementation group A cells, uh, to try and better get at the molecular defects in the uh, cellular responsiveness to cross-linking agents. And we'd love to have a collaboration um, for, with anybody who's interested in testing some of this out in, in a diagnostic or, or other settings where you think it could help with your Fanconi, Fanconi patients. 
in a project highly related to that that I'll just touch on briefly, um, we're interested in the use of or the sensitivity of um, not just Fanconi cells, but human cancers to DNA cross-linking agents. And the best known example there would be platinum-based chemotherapies, which are used in about half of cancer patients who get chemotherapy, uh, spanning a large number of different tumor types. And the resistance to platinum-based chemotherapies, again, which are these DNA cross-linking agents, is a major determinant of patient survival. And so understanding mechanisms of resistance is an urgent clinical goal for a lot of different tumor types. I'll briefly just kind of overview a project we have going on here. I'm not going to go into details in it because it's not uh, quite mature enough yet, but I wanted to bring it up in case there are folks there who would be interested in collaborating in something like this as well. Um, we are in the middle of a large proteogenomic project where we're doing analyses of um, ovarian cancer, and these are high-grade serous ovarian cancers, and we're profiling both preclinical models such as cell lines and PDX models that represent sensitive and refractory um, platinum uh, cases. And in addition, we're doing a large number of archived human ovarian cancers, uh, again, representing both sensitive and platinum refractory disease. We've generated over 10 terabytes of data that we're now swimming in and, and in the middle of analyzing. We've curated over 30 years of literature on the platinum response of human tumors, and that's being integrated with the proteomic, proteogenomic profiling <clears throat> to identify consistent findings, which then will, are being taken forward into two arms. One is to test um, uh, uh, some of the hypotheses coming out of this with functional studies and cell lines, hoping to identify potential new drug targets in platinum refractory disease, and in the other arm, uh, building a targeted assay that can help us predict platinum refractoriness at the time of diagnosis in patients in order to avoid futile chemotherapy, which is a major problem, especially in ovarian cancer, where the disease tends to be diagnosed late to begin with. And then by the time we um, determine that a patient's tumor is non-responsive to platinum, uh, they've progressed usually to the point where many of them are too sick to participate in clinical trials. And so it's really a dire clinical situation where we'd like to uh, make some progress by identifying those patients up, up front and getting them into a trial as quickly as possible. So if this interests anybody, um, it's um, great, great, another great opportunity for collaborative efforts. And then I, I mentioned previously that I was going to talk a little bit about a tissue-based um, assay that we're hoping to translate into a laboratory-developed test. And this project really uh, was stimulated by a call I got a couple of years ago from NCI saying, gosh, we have creatives signed uh, with, for example, on 30 to 50 antibody drug conjugates that we want to test in clinical trials. And we'd like to open up an arm in our precision oncology trials for each one of these 30 to 50 drugs. And the problem is that we need to be able to, to measure the expression of the targets of those drugs, the target proteins, in hundreds of patients per week. So 50 proteins in hundreds of samples per week uh, to triage enough patients into all of these arms. And it's just not feasible to do that with IHC. The scale is too high. And so the question was, could we put together a multiplex assay that could quantify all of these therapeutic targets in a single quantitative assay to help triage these patients, um, even if you did a confirmatory IHC downstream, uh, an MRM assay could be used for an initial triage step. And so uh, as what we've been working on recently is a proof of concept of that. And to do that, we focused on an antibody drug conjugate that is targeting the breast cancer biomarker HER2. We developed an immuno MRM assay for HER2. It's a multiplex assay that quantifies other proteins as well, but I'm gonna um, focus mostly on HER2 for the purpose of this talk. Uh, we, we did the bioanalytical validation assessed and determined the performance of the assay, uh, which I won't go through here, but um, the, the validated assay was then run on 
a set of almost 200 breast cancers, some of which were frozen and some of which were archival hormone fixed paraffin embedded tumors. These, uh, this set of tumors represented a wide range of tumor cellularity to challenge the assay. Uh, recall that MRM is an extraction assay. And so um, the issue of micro or heterogeneity in tumor content from sample to sample is likely to um, cause issues with some of these um, calls and some of these extraction assays. And we thought this was going to be a really big problem. And, and in our multiplex panel, we had included assays to proteins that are specific to tumor compartments. So we have adipose markers, we have lymphocyte markers, red cell markers, stroma markers, tumor markers, and so on in this panel. And it turns out that for, for HER2, it really, um, the assay performed fantastically, even in the setting of this much um, heterogeneity and tumor cellularity. And in talking with um, the anatomic pathologists that we collaborated with and uh, folks over at UW Medical Center, like Jeff Baird, they said they actually weren't surprised because for an IHC assay to actually make it into clinical use, it has to be a pretty big distinction between the the biomarker positive and negative categories is because of the nature of the technology. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, uh, we, we see a, a over 500 fold range of expression in HER2 in the IHC positive uh, tumors uh, based on the pathology calls. Uh, and interestingly, um, we also can detect a 70 fold range of expression of protein in the classically IHC negative group these are IHC 0 plus, 1 plus, or 2 plus with negative fish. And that's important that we can make reliable quantitation, uh, reliable measurements down here, because these antibody drug conjugates have activity in these so-called HER2 low tumors, where the conventional um, trastuzumab, for example, doesn't have activity. And there are no good assays for selecting patients who might respond to these ADCs down in that low HER2 uh, setting. And so this, of course, begs the obvious question of whether the more quantitative HER2 assay that can, can separate those patients could help to select patients with HER2 low tumors who might respond. And this is an area where we're actively looking for collaboration. We, we need to get some uh, legacy trial samples from patients who have response data to see if our assay can actually predict that. So of note, this is a, a model that could be generalized to ADCs, where you could make a multiplex assay that could quantify the, the, ther the expression of the target of the ADC in the tumors. You could also quantify the expression of the target of the warhead or the payload. Uh, and you could quantify downstream responses, pharmacodynamic responses. And in fact, we're set up to do that beautifully for HER2, where we already have validated immuno MRM assays to three of the four EGF family members that influence the internalization of the ADC into the cell, and hence the delivery of the payload. And we have an assay to DNA topoisomerase 1, which is the target of the warhead attached to this new uh, HER2 targeting ADC. And we've now got hundreds of assays that let us target activation of the DNA damage response. And so a project moving forward is to make a custom multiplex panel around this ADC that can enable uh, patient selection as well as pharmacodynamic mechani and mechanism of action uh, studies. And you can see where this proof of concept will be translatable to really any ADC. Most of them use either agents that target the DNA damage response or target uh, microtubules. And so you could easily have kind of a base assay into which you could multiplex um, targets of, of, of different ADCs to help um, do these patient selections. So toward the goal of trying to move <clears throat> this clinically and support initially to support clinical trials, uh, we established a CLIA lab uh, at the Fred Hutch that's devoted to running these MRM assays in support of clinical trials. Uh, this HER2 assay is the first assay that we've CLIA certified. Uh, we're working on a PDL1 assay CLIA certification right now, and we're working on our CAP certification. We also <clears throat> wanted to start engaging. Uh, the regulatory community. So we submitted an FDA pre-submission on this, on this um, 
HER2 immuno mRNA assay, asking them, showing them all of our data and saying we wanted to use it for patient stratification in an NCI match trial in order to get feedback from the FDA, which actually was quite <clears throat> positive. And so um, uh, there's still a ways to go. This is kind of the state of where things are, but we're hoping this will be an example of a first assay that we, we can translate um, into the clinical realm uh, to influence patient care. <clears throat> so we have um, a large inventory of assays that have already been built over the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, you can access the catalog of those online uh, on my lab's uh, website. All of those assays are run now in our CLIA environment. There are over 1,700 validated assays. Uh, we have a very large and ongoing effort to generate monoclonal antibodies that can be used to support these assays. We've come, we're coming up on 500 antibodies that my lab has generated. Uh, we have another 174 in our pipeline, so we have a large dedicated effort to building out um, a, a catalog, and that's important because if someone comes to you and wants to write something into a clinical trial, they can't wait a year for an, a an assay to get developed or pharma has a, a trial ongoing and wants some PD studies. It's really important um, to translate these to have off-the-shelf assays. We're trying to now get those assays as best we can into thematic assay panels based on um, cellular pathways or networks that are relevant to cancer. I mentioned DNA damage response. I think we have four or five assay panels around this now. Uh, we have uh, RAS and MAP kinase signaling. We have a very large ongoing effort in the uh, immuno-oncology space, developing over 400 assays to quantify immunomodulatory proteins either in blood uh, or in the tumor microenvironment uh, to support uh, IO clinical trials and, uh, and drug translation. And so um, if anybody's interested in collaborating or any of these assays, um, please check out our website and, and reach out to me. I'd love to talk with you about it. And we also have spearheaded efforts to generate public resources of standardized and validated targeted proteomic assays. And in fact, Stephanie and I worked together um, through the CPTAC program at NCI in a working group that um, stimulated the development of the CPTAC assay portal, which you can find at assays.cancer.gov. Uh, this portal now contains over 2,500 validated targeted proteomic assays. They have to have a minimum amount of validation, you know, um, response curves, for example, with figures of merit. And the characterization data is all available for downloading and viewing in that portal. So you can take a look at the actual data yourself. Um, it um, works with the Skyline, uh, which is sort of the universal open source software that folks use who, who, who do a lot of these targeted proteomic assays. So if you have a local instance running of that, you can actually look at the chromatograms from the, the data. There also are downloadable standard operating protocols that were used in the generation of that data to facilitate the um, adoption of these assays in other laboratories. <clears throat> In addition to that, we are major contributors to a sister portal at CPTAC, which is at antibodies.cancer.gov. And the goal of this program is to uh, distribute to the uh, research community highly characterized monoclonal antibodies. Uh, in this case, for this is a non-commercial distribution through the Developmental Studies Hybridoma Bank at the University of Iowa uh, that we've partnered with. And so you can't grab it from there and commercialize it, but you can grab it from there and use it for all the, all the research purposes that you want. And um, the vast majority of antibodies that we develop get deposited through here. We're a major contributor to this portal. Um, there are over 750 antibodies in there right now. And the NCI takes the antibodies that we develop and puts it through um, uh, validation for um, more traditional applications as well as the MRM uses that we do. And so again, these can all be accessed at antibodies.cancer.gov. So um, just uh, back to the big picture for a minute. So we don't actually see ourselves as replacing IHC. I, I get that question a lot. That's not the, the purpose of this. I think IHC has an important role to play and that the, these technologies are 
um, highly complementary. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able at any time soon to do single cell analysis with MRM or spatial or geographical re resolution. Um, so IHC is certainly going to continue to be important for assays where that's critical. Um, we also um, need uh, path review of the tumor tissue for um, some of these assays. So we have characterized what is going into the MRM assay, which of course is an extraction assay. But as I hope I've highlighted during the course of this talk, MRM does offer some complementary advantages as well. And so the way I think about it is that um, just like our um, anatomic pathologist now might order special stains to help further characterize a patient's tumor, that in the future there'll be uh, panels of validated um, laboratory developed tests based on a multiplex MRM that can be uh, likewise be a tool in their toolkit and that anatomic and clinical pathologists will work even more closely in that the anatomic pathologist might order, just like special stains, uh, MRM panels to further characterize a tumor uh, to, to help select uh, uh, pa patient therapies even better than we do right now. And we, what the ultimate hope would be is that instead of um, basing our patient care in a completely genome-driven fashion, fashion, that molecular tumor boards will receive proteogenomic reports instead of just genomic reports, um, and that the proteomic data will actually complement the genomic data uh, and help to improve our success rates. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the core folks in my lab who um, have done most of the work that I talked about and, the and in the large collaborative projects that I talked about, such as the CPTAC program and the pediatric brain cancer study or the AstraZeneca study. It's a very uh, large network of folks that we work with, um, many of whom are listed, listed on this side, slide. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to uh, answer any questions. And as I mentioned, we really, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an oncologist, I'm not a technologist, uh, although sometimes it feels like I am. And so we developed all of this to benefit uh, the patients and really depend, I, I don't see patients anymore. It became too difficult to do this at scale and do that uh, well. And so we really depend on clinical collaborations for the translation of all this work. And so highly value collaborations and our very collaborative group. And if there's any interest, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mandy, for that wonderful and exciting talk. So if anybody has questions, I guess you can just turn on your video and ask away. So. Hi, Mandy. This is Leo Furk. Um, uh, terrific talk. Thank you. It was so interesting. Um, I wanted to comment on the HER2 seemingly negative um, or low that you found. So there's a local company called Cellcuity. Full disclosure, I'm on their board of directors. Um, they have a functional assay. They're looking at breast and ovarian tumors. So they take primary explants from patients. Uh, and they have a biophysical methodology that looks at conductance, or they call it impedance, um, of the, the way electrical currents flow through the cell. And what they've learned is um, the drugs that are effective in these cells, and they've tested a lot uh, beyond HER2 and what have you, uh, drug, um, they can see a perturbation in the, in the conductance because the it slightly changes the shape of the cell, and then the, um, the conductance changes. So they have found and are working on collaborations that uh, with large companies that uh, you can find a whole class of HER2 negative patients that actually do respond. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will uh, mention this uh, to the company if they have interest. I'll you cut out at the end, Leo, but... Um, oh, yeah, what I would said, if um, I will um, uh, give them this lecture, they can watch it, and if they have interest, I'll make an introduction for you. Okay, yeah, I would love to chat with them. Thanks for letting me know about that. That sounds interesting. Hey, Mandy, this is Andy Nelson. I'm on the faculty here. I'm a molecular pathologist and do research in breast and ovarian cancer. So um, I apologize. Sometimes I get very confused keeping track of a lot of acronyms through a talk. But I just wanted to go back for your, you know, obviously telling you what I work on, you know, some of the things I'm interested in. 
thinking about your DNA damage response assay, I, I, I recognize that a lot of that work was done on PBMCs. Is, do you have tissue compatible versions of that assay, either fresh frozen tissue or FFPE tissue? Because obviously through some of the other strings, some of your assays work on FFPE, but I didn't get the sense that necessarily all of them do. Yeah, thanks, Andy. That's a great question. Um, we have run the assays on tissues. Um, what I would say, we don't. I don't have a any sort of a, a, a data set that I can tell you about where, because um, we haven't done experiments like this where the assay was used to predict a response or to demonstrate a response on the tissue. That's not something that has been tried to date. Um, with regard to frozen versus FFPE. Um, in, in general, uh, the gold standard for proteomics is flash frozen samples, which of course aren't always available. The FFP is more broadly available. And for FFPE, um, we can run most of our uh, assays that target unmodified proteins in FFPE samples, and they work fine. The detection limits are a little bit worse. You lose a little bit of signal there. And some of the peptides, presumably because of cross-linking, um, that you can see in, in frozen, you, you don't see in FFPE. So it's it's not ideal, but we run lots of assays, even beyond the DDR assays, um, in FFPE samples. We have a huge experience with FFPE samples. Um, the tricky thing, as you know, even for IHC, is trying to measure phosphorylations in archived tissues, and, and that's... Um, for two reasons, really. One is the pre-analytical variation is a major issue in this collection of those FFP samples. The phosphoproteome is quite labile, and so a lot of pre-analytical variation happens, and that's not specific to MRM assays. That's for any, any measurement technology. But the other problem is um, phosphorylations are um, orders of magnitude more difficult to detect in the mass spectrometer than unmodified peptides. And so you also need more material to input into the assay in order to detect phosphorylations. And so you're not gonna do that off a section or two for most, I mean, there'll be some phosphorylations you can do, but most of the ones people wanna measure, you're gonna need more tissue than that. And in some cases, that's an issue as well. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. In the context of our ovarian cancer precision medicine program, we do have a pretty big archive of fr fresh frozen tissue. We've got paired single cell RNA-seq data on all of those tissues. Um, so I'll definitely get your information and get a copy of this talk to in front of uh, Tim Starr and Boris Winterhoff from my colleagues that, that help run that program. I, I think that there could be some cool stuff that we could do together. Randy, and, I think Boris might be talking um, that NCI ovarian project I co-lead with Mike Beerer. Yep. And I That's think us. Boris yeah. is I, I support Boris and Tim, so we're kind of the triumvirate, Jin Wang Wang also from the Cancer Center uh, uh, in bioinformatics. The, kind of the four of us are the, the primary co-PIs of the project for the various different aspects, whether it's the surgical, the genetics, the bioinformatics, the basic science, and the single cell, which is Tim. So, I so, think yeah. Boris just put, or uh, Mike just put Boris in touch with a guy in my lab um, who's trying to use single cell data to tease out the microheterogeneity in our discovery data set. So cool. There's some fledgling connections there, but it would be great. To cool. Yeah, that'd be great to connect. I, I do. I don't know if anybody else is, is logged on, but I have a, a, another follow-up question too, honestly, and, and a lot of what you just discussed with the phosphopeptides leads into it. Uh, with the assays that we're looking at, um, you know, kinase signaling and, and levels of, say, MATK, you know, various members of the MATK pathway, um, as far as getting cutoffs and, and figuring out, you know, where on like a ROC curve or, you know, where is the best cutoff between a low level and a high level activation, not activated. Do you look at other downstream analytes, rather total protein levels or other downstream phospho levels within the pathway to kind of come up with like a multi-analyte signature of activation or does that get too complicated too quickly? Oh, it's a great question. And I think your thinking is more advanced than we are right now, <laughs> to be honest. Um, that's uh, in science. Well, I think that's where it has to go, um, really, Andy. But I don't think any project has matured to the point where anybody's making ROC curves on phosphor signaling networks yet. I, I don't know of any, anyway. 
um, certainly not within the clinical proteomic network that I'm part of. So I think it's a, it's, um, a, an, a great question and something that's going to get encountered at some point. At this point, like the, you mentioned the MEC activation, that pediatric brain tumor project, it was simply a, um, the, the proteogenomic data were um, included phosphorylation data, phosphoprotein profiles of all those tumors. And what, um, what picked that up was a, a kinase activity score. And so how that works is for a subset of human kinases, there are well-characterized substrates to those kinases, right? And to the extent that you see those substrates in your proteomic profiles, you can ask whether they're phosphorylated or not. And so um, that leads to a score. There's a computational algorithm that the statisticians use to create an activity score for each of those kinases. And that's what picked up the MEK kinase. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. That, yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that, that's essentially the idea that I'm getting at. So it does sound like people are, have kind of put that into, a, into some type of a computational practice, which is really cool. Good. But I think you're being more sophisticated about it. Uh, but, but, about yeah. that, but thank you. <laughs> awesome. Great. Great. So to clinically translate it, right, it's going to have to convert into something like what you're talking about. And I think that's sort of a, it hasn't happened yet. Sure. Awesome. Well, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask a question some more. So on the technical side, so from um, the proteomic uh, sample preparation, so there's so many different sources of variability um, from the digestion, desalting, and then the chromatography, and even the mass spec variability. So um, can you just speak to how you have um, incorporated automation in some of your uh, MRM assays? Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Stephanie. That's a great question. Um, we've, um, aut we have a, a liquid handling robot. So all of our assays are performed in a 96 well format. We, um, we work really align ourselves closely with the pathologists at the university medical center. And, you know, Andy Hoofnagel, a common colleague of ours, we've worked with him for years and Jeff Baird and those guys over there. So we have a set of standards also that go into every 96 well plate system suitability standards and, uh, calibrators and quality control standards, and those are scattered throughout every plate. The plate goes into the liquid handling robot for most of the manipulations. Um, and um, for the captures, the immunocaptures, we take our antibodies and couple them to magnetic beads. And we have a Kingfisher magnetic bead handler uh, that also has a 96 well head on it that we use to kind of to move the beads around. And so just through really strict standard operating protocols, the inclusion of all of those standards, and we, we generate Levy Jennings plots and follow everything over time, look for things that fall out of range. Um, I, I think we've, we've got things fairly well locked down. It's not, you know, there are of course limitations in the MRM or in the mass spec applications in clinic two, right? These are not cheap assays, they're high complexity, they require expensive equipment especially these low abundance nucleo, nuclear phosphoproteins were at nanoflow rates. Um, and so, you know, autom there's, all, there's all kinds of, you know, little nuanced things that, that make this challenging to, to translate. But to the extent possible, I think we've automated the steps that we can. For the FFPE <clears throat> tissues, we, we have found that we get better protein yields when we section and mount those on blast slides. And so we have a crude... Um, little uh, machine that kind of dips the <laughs> slides for us, but we still need to automate some more of that, for example. Uh, the upstream extraction of proteins from uh, flash frozen tissues is not automated um, fully. We have a covirus um, cryopulverizer, so every tumor kind of gets hand put into a bag, put into the cryopulverizer, and it doesn't really, the automation really starts once, it, once the, the lysates hit the 96 well plate. Um, and then the downstream steps and the assay are kind of automated, but upstream of that, there's still quite a bit of sort of hand uh, processing work that goes on. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I, don't, I have another question if nobody else has a question. The other thing we're work, working on maybe just to touch on is uh, trying to get the sample requirements down as low as possible because people are very spoiled by genomics. <laughs> You need more than, you know, a, 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 a dander flake of tissue from clinical trials. Everybody wants to know what's wrong with you. 
uh, well, you know, we don't have PCR in proteomic, so it does take more uh, sample. And so um, we're trying to get that down as low as possible, doing things, um, uh, we, we call them microplots. One of our collaborators has a nanoplot, but automating with a robot the sample prep um, involved in, in, in generating the, the sample for the mass spec and doing it in a droplet on a glass slide instead of in a 96 well plate where there's a lot of contact with plastics and things and you know you lose you lose protein to all those surfaces that things encounter going through pipettes and things and so we are trying to automate um, that right now but that's sort of not prime time yet that's kind of work in development great awesome thank you yeah um, another question i have a quick question um, I don't know, maybe you have d discussed this issue, but a, a lot depends in case of HER2 and some other proteins. A lot depends on the location. Is it in the membrane of the cell or not? So do you have a way to to def define, if, if, is it at the cell membrane? And yeah. the question, how good is your method at looking at uh, proteins with a lot of uh, similarities and polymorphisms such as uh, HLA, human uh, leukocyte antigens, uh, MHC? Yeah, thanks for your questions. Um, in terms of um, uh, geographical localization within the cell of a marker, um, we don't currently do that. Uh, in theory, you could, um, I don't know how throughput may, we've not tried anything like that at this point. You could try to you know, do membrane preps from the sample and, and specifically quantify a membrane versus a soluble prep. Um, in theory, you could do that. I don't know that anybody has functionalized that into anything that looks like a clinically translatable assay at this point. So that hasn't been done. Um, uh, uh, the second question, sorry, uh, remind me the second question. So uh, some proteins that are kind of important and related to the membrane presence versus not is MHC, which is the target yes. for immune yeah. system. So, and there's a lot of similarity between alleles and starch. So how would your method, of, you know, a lot of methods get lost between the different alleles? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question too. Um, any any peptide that flies well in a mass spectrometer can be converted into an assay. And in fact, we have uh, either already developed or in, developed, uh, in development uh, immuno MRM assays to um, many different MHC proteins as part of the immuno-oncology uh, project that I didn't have time to go into. I'd be happy to go into it with you if that's something that you're interested in. And, and in the development of those assays, um, as well as all of our assays, uh, before we, if we want to make an assay to a protein, we do an extensive look at all of the available peptides in that protein that we can target for assay development. And we look at many things. It's a, it's a giant spreadsheet in the end of things we looked at because it really matters what peptide you pick. But one of the, uh, in terms of how good your assay ends up, but one of the things we look at is um, uh, minor allele um, frequencies. We don't want to make an assay to a peptide where there's a minor allele fr frequency in you know 20% of the population, and the assay is not going to work on 20% of the patients. So. Um, we spend a fair amount of time looking at that in the selection of the assays, either trying to avoid them or in the cases of, you know, we have pan-keratin assays, for example, we try to find areas of commonality and so the converse, right? Sometimes we're trying to avoid those and sometimes we're trying to actually take advantage of um, conserved regions. Um, so we, we, we are able to do that and we do think quite a bit about that. If you're interested in the IO project, there's a whole another slide deck we could go through and chat about that sometime. It might be of interest. Yeah, thanks. That was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And once again, thank you so much, Mandy, for getting up super early to be with us here today. I think we've stimulated a lot of um, great um, um, ideas for collaboration and great conversations. And so thank you very much again for sharing your wonderful and awesome work with us. Um, I think we're a little bit past the top of the hour and Mandy does have some meetings scheduled with um, colleagues from our department and also other departments. So um, I guess this will bring this grand rounds to a close and thank you everybody again. Really appreciate it.